Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to be here. We're going to continue in our sermon series called Listen. And we're talking from and speaking from the book of Revelation. Now, when you hear the book of Revelation, people get all afraid. Or they're talking about end times, you know, is God coming back? You know, only he knows that. Only the Father knows that. So we don't get caught up in that. But what do this message is this. If God was going to pen a letter to our church, what would he say? And so as we've gone through these last several weeks, understanding that John getting this revelation of who Jesus is and the, the alpha, the omega, and how God began to give him revelation of the expectation of these churches and what's to come, people began to understand that John, the beloved, said, you know what, we got to get this word to these people because if not, they're going to perish. And so as we've been over this journey over the last couple of weeks, talking about Ephesus and other churches like Smyrna and Philadelphia, you begin to realize, man, that Ephesus being a church that was loveless or, you know, you think of the church in, uh, uh, in Pigrigorum uh, being in a, a church that was full of adultery and the Jezebel spirit running loose and all these things. Heresy being preached, but God was merciful. God was generous. God was willing to give them a second chance. How many of you know that God is a God of second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and even seven chances? But man, this last church, and as I began to study this church, I was like, man, because you crack the Bible open and you start reading about this church, you're thinking, man, what was it about this church? because the Lord Jesus said this was the worst church. Now I'm thinking, wait a minute, you got heresy, you got adultery, you got people doing things they shouldn't be doing, but what's so bad, what's worse than that? And so as I began to read this and study this, I began to humble myself and be like, man, I better check myself because if this is bad in the eyes of God, we got a lot of work to do. But before I get started, I do have a, a question. How many in here are water snobs? Raise your hand. No, no, I'm talking about real, genuine, authentic water snobs. Not that tap water stuff. Baby, will you bring that up here to me real quick? I remember my wife up here. See, I, I, two things that you're going to know about me as a pastor. Some of you may know or may not. Number one, I'm a diehard, thoroughbred racing fan. So if, I love watching the ponies run May 1st, the first Saturday in May. Don't call me, don't text me, don't talk to me. That is Derby weekend. So from May to July, our head is on this thing. But down here, what you see here is another thing that I like to be. I'm a water snob. If you bring me tap water, I might just, I might lose my salvation. That's just how crazy it is. <laughs> And so what you have down front here, you have the finest tap water, bottled water that has to offer. You got Perrier, it's my nice. You got Topo Chico. You have what we have here. You have uh, a, a little San Pellegrino. You got uh, a little bit of Saratoga here in Saratoga, New York. This is the finest sparkling water that New York has to offer. And then you have here, yesterday, I'm a foodie too, so my wife and I, if we see something on TV, we're not waiting around, one day we're going to go there, no, today's the day. So yesterday, on our date day, we, you know, we said, look, man, we're, we're, we're going to eat, I don't know where, but we go to this Portuguese restaurant, and I get this bottle of water from Portuguese. woo I was so excited. Portugal, bottle of water, my good. Castello with the lime in it took me to another level. Started speaking in tongues, baby, because it was over the top. <laughs> now you're saying, Pastor, what does this have to do with the message? What does this got to do with the message? What you're going to learn here is you turn to your Bible in Revelations 3, 14, and 12. See, this thing about sparkling water is this. If you serve this to a true connoisseur of sparkling water, warm, they might hit you in the mouth. You never serve this warm. It has to be cold. But if it's lukewarm, just like I did one time in Germany, I was drinking water. They brought water and I drank it and I spewed it out because it was lukewarm water. Horrible. And here in Revelation 3, 14 through 12, it says this. To the angel of the church of Laodicea, these are the words of the amen, the faithful, the true witness, the ruler of God, the creation. I know your deeds, 
that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, highlight that word, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich, but I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Man, Jesus is going in on this church. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful naked and, uh, and, and self to appear on your eyes so you can see. Verse 19, those who I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest to repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come and eat with them, that person, and they with me. Verse 21, to one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with the right or with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the spirit says to the church. Laodicea. Laodicea was a city that was prideful on their upbringing and what they had in their customs. She was a wealthy church, a wealthy city. And they were known for their black wool that was exported, that brought them great wealth. They were known for their medicine. They created this eye ointment that they exported that would bring healing to the eyes. And they were big in the Greek God of Menkai, and they would begin to follow this God because he was so-called the God of healing. And so many people would travel all over the place because this city was the city in the area that even the Roman people would come to to serve and to be a part of because it was so wealthy and it was so known. But what this city was really known for was to the north, they had what they called hot springs. And in these hot springs, people would go up there and bathe and so that they could be there and, 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 and take on for the healing. And down south, they would have cool springs where you could go and drink of the fresh, cool water. And what they would do is through these aqueducts, they would bring this water into the city. But by the time the water hit the city, it was lukewarm to the point where it made the people in the city sick. So they had a water problem. And just like I said about this water here, there was something that God was trying to communicate to this church. The same thing that you hate in your city, that lukewarm water is the same thing I hate about you, is that you are lukewarm. I would rather you be hot or be cold. I'd rather you be for me or be against me. But if you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out. People, I'm telling you this morning that God is asking you to make a decision not to play games or to come to church or to dress up nice, but either be the man or woman of God that you've called to be or not be the man or woman that you're called to be because God hates the in-between. And as if we've learned in this also is that they, you saw these names of God. It says that he's the amen, that he's the faithful, and he's the true witness. These new names that have been introduced to us by God. See, God is the amen. See, the thing about God is he's steady, he's unchangeable, and all his promises prevail. God is a God that he cannot lie. That's what the Bible says in Titus 1-2. When God speaks something, when God declares a thing, it will happen. It says that God is the beginning of the creation. That means that God is the originator. God is the one that initiates. God is the one that was at the beginning and he's at the end. And he's also the God of the in-between. And so we have to understand that he is the Lord of all creation. And see, they understood what it meant to be the beginning because they're emperors. They were introduced as the beginning, a deity, a God. But there's only one true one and living God and his name is Jesus. See, God hates fake. And my first point I want to make is this, is keep it 100. Keep it 100. See, real recognizes real. 
And if you're faking, you're going to get baked. You're going to get pushed out. People can smell a fake. People can see it from a distance. Man, you say you're one thing, but you're living another. And they thought just because they had it going on. Yeah, they had a nice pocket square. They had the Ferragamo shoes. They had a nice belt. They had it going on. But let me tell you something. The outward ain't going to help you. It's what's on the inside that's going to help you. And so he said, keep it 100. Keep it 100. See, God blesses those poor in spirit, those that realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs, Matthew 5, 3. You have to understand that you can be rich on the outside but bankrupt in the spirit. And that's what it was all about is that God is like looking at them. You're professing. You're calling yourself a Christian, a Christ follower. You're calling yourself this. But really, I know what's going on. I see what's happening. You don't even realize that you have sin in your life that you need to confess and run from, get away from. Can you say self-awareness this morning? Self-awareness. See, a lot of times we're not even aware of what's going on inside of us. We're not even aware of what we got going on around us. And I remember being in college. I'm so happy we got college students here. I love college students. I got a daughter that graduated from college. We have one that's in college, and I got one, a son on the way to college. And you know why I'm happy? Because they're about to get off my payroll. So that's why I'm happy. <laughs> and so this is... In college, I remember I had this couch. Man, anybody got a futon? You know what I'm talking about, that old broke down, nasty futon. Everybody got a futon. And so we'd come in, our, and we could not figure out where the smell was coming from. We was like, man, we're, something stinks in here. So we're all turning stuff over, man, taking the trash out. You know, man, we're athletes, so we're throwing out socks and shoes. And, man, it just stinks in here. And one day somebody came and said, man, I, I think it might be that futon. Nah, man, it ain't the futon. Keep the, we love the futon. The futon is the best thing. In the, that's our furniture. We got to keep that. Kept going stank. And, you know, there's a difference between stink and stank. <laughs> See, if something stinks, man, you can put a little Febreze on it, and that's going to deal with it, right? But if something stank, you're going to have to burn that thing, get it out of the house, throw it out. That futon stank. And we had to get rid of it. And, you know, that's the same way it is with God. God is like, something stinks. Something ain't right. You don't even get it. You ain't self-aware that your sin stinks to me. And you're trying to come to me in any old kind of way. Man, I'm telling you right now, if you're trying to holler at a girl, you better make sure you got some good smelling sauce on, cologne. You better make sure your breath is right. Because if you come to her the wrong way, she's going to send you the other way. And that's the same thing with the Lord. You come to God, oh, Lord, give me this. Do that. Lord, I need this. But you got sin in your life, and that sin is stank to him. He don't draw to me. Don't come to me that way. Get yourself right before you come to me. That's the Lord. The Bible says this. In Matthew 5, 4 through 2, it says, God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Mourn. What does that mean? Mourn. We're talking about keeping it 100. See, when you mourn the way he mourns over sin, see, sin separates you and I from God. And see, when I break the heart of the Lord, man, I want to know, man, this ain't right, that I have to get my life in order. See, the, the Laodiceans, they thought, man, this is, this is what's so scary. See, in that culture, they thought because they were blessed that they were okay in the eyes of God. See, you can have all the good things. You can have the bells and whistles. You can look good on the outside. But they thought they were blessed, but they were a mess. And see, until you start to mourn how he mourns, see, God wants to draw near to you. God wants to spend time with you. God wants to love on you. But, man, he can't get to you the way he wants to get to you if you got stuff in your life that you're not willing to get rid of. You got to get rid of it. You know, I get the privilege on a, a, a just during the year of football, NFL, a Pastor Adam, myself, we get to steward 
if you will, as chaplains for the New York Jets, you know, that great football team on the other side of the Hudson. I'm sorry, Jet Giant fans, but we love the Jets here. We pray for the Giants, but we love the Jets. So just want to let y'all know that. <laughs> I hear you. And so what will happen is, is these guys play this game where they run their heads into each other. Everybody ever seen that? They hit each other. And when they hit each other, sometimes they, 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 they kind of lose kind of what we call focus. It's something that's out there called a concussion. And what happens is, is they'll, they'll they, I see it and they, they get walking, they stumbling, they, you know, they, they can't see what they can't feel themselves. I've had one before and it's not funny. It tastes like metal when you get hit like that. And you're just walking around and all of a sudden the, the doctor's trying to get you. He's trying to hold you up and, and he, well, just what he'll say. He's going to say, are you okay? And what's the number one word we're using today in America? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. And then they take you into this tent and they begin to do these checks on you. And when they do this check, they're going to know if you're good or not. And sometimes guys are sneaky because they kind of know the trick. And so they'll be, I'm good. And they'll go back out there, but they're still woozy because a couple days later, they wake up with head, their head hurting and the lights are bright. And they say, you know what? I need to go see a doctor. And when they run that scan over them, do that MRI, and they see that swelling on the brain, and they know this guy needs to take a week off. He needs to be shut down. That's the same thing that God is saying for you and I. Stop saying that you're good when we know you ain't good because he's running that scanner spiritually over your life, checking you out, and he's saying, man, you need to sit down, and you need to have, be self-aware, and we need to slowly but surely allow you to be healed. See, what a lot of people don't want is when I hear that word, I'm good, it's telling me that you really ain't good. Husbands, you know what I'm talking about. So when me and Pastor Nathan are down here and we're talking to the husbands, man, how's your marriage? Oh, bro, we good. Everything is great, man. We went here. We did this. I bought her that. Uh-huh. And I say, okay, how is your marriage to the wife? Oh, it's horrible. Oh, oh, this is so bad. He ain't acting right. The kids are crazy. Oh, oh, oh. And here's the reason why. It's because you're not good. See, that word I'm good means this. I'm hurt. I need help. But I don't want to let you get close enough to me. Because if you knew what I was really going through, you might kick me out to church. But let me tell you something, we all got junk. We all got issues. We all got problems. We all tore up from the flow up. We all got some things going on in the side. Some of y'all got skeletons in the closet. Some of y'all got cemeteries in the closet. But you know what? Everybody got something going on. And what I want to tell y'all today, keep it 100. Lord, I'm wrong. You're right. I need help and you're the helper. Please, God, don't let me stay in this state, but deal with me and get this junk out of my life. Just like that girl said on the screen, I'm tired of fighting the devil because the only thing the devil respects is power, and I need your power to get out of my soul and to help me be the man or woman of God that you've called me to be. Keep it 100. Keep it 100. You know, God is a God of love and mercy, too. And so I don't want you to think, oh, pastor's up here beating us up, man. That ain't right. No, the Bible says this, Psalms, in Psalms 103, as far as the east is to the west, he forgives us our sins. And so what we have to learn is that when I confess those faults, when I have godly sorrow, not worldly sorrow, but when I'm truly genuine, authentic, and, 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 and turning away from my sin, then what happens is this, God comes in by his grace and mercy, and he heals but then we have worldly sorrow, and worldly sorrow is this, Pastor, I'm sorry that I did it. I'm sorry that I got caught, but I'm going to go ahead and do it again. My second point is this, is don't hide. Don't hide. See, it said that he's Lord of all creation. 
And so what happens is, is when I'm sinning, what I do is I try to hide my sin. It says that they tried to hide what they were doing from the Lord, but you can't hide from God because God sees all. He knows all. He's sovereign. And so just like the children in the, in the, uh, in the garden, Adam and Eve, what did they do? Instead of hiding, instead of, uh, instead of just running to God, they hid. And so they tried to hide from God. But you know what I know about God is God is a great hide-and-go-seek person. See, the same way when they hid, he said that God pursued. And that's the God that we love and that's the God that we serve. Even in the midst of our foolishness, he's still going to pursue you. Just like some of y'all on that campus the other day pursuing people to get right with the Lord, God is the same way with you and I. He will track you down. He will chase you down. He will make sure that, man, I'm going to put you in a position to give your life back to me. Hebrews 4.13, nothing in all creation is hidden from the sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before his eyes. And to we must give an account. That's scary. So one day I'm going to have to stand before the Lord. We are. We're going to have to and give an account on what we did. That church is going to have to give an account on what they did. Did you confess your faults and turn from your wicked ways? Or did you continue to stay in your sin, knowing that you're sinning and living the way that you're living and choosing to disobey instead of repenting, turning back to God, allowing me to come into your life and to refresh? Did you do that? Give an account. I used to love going on to college campus. I used to be the HBCU director. You know what that means? I was with a whole lot of black folk. And so I'd be on this campus, man, and I'd be out there doing all this stuff on these black colleges, and I'd be out there. And it would be so funny because you know when you are raised a certain way, when grandmama and them raise you, you know you ain't going to get, you just might as well just give up if you got a praying mama, a praying grandmother. You might as well just give up because this is a matter of time before you're going to have to get right. And I'd walk up to these guys with crosses on their neck, they got all the jewelry going, you know, they blinged out, man, they got the ice on them. They, yeah. I'm like, bro, what you doing, man? He's like, I said, you living for Jesus? Put his head down like, man, no, I ain't right, bro. I ain't right. Nah, man, I ain't right. I'm like, that's a good start. At least you know. But let me help you get right. Let me show you what you need to do with God. Let me take this Bible and show you that you can live a life of purity that you can be a man or woman of God, that you ain't got to let somebody just love on you for your body, but you can find a God that can love your soul. Let me find somebody. His name is Jesus. Don't hide. Run to him. Don't run from him. Man, I got so many stories, but I got to hurry up. Pastor Nathan telling me to hurry up, brother. Proverbs 28, 12. <laughs> I got time? I got time? Praise the Lord. He gave me another 45 minutes. Y'all better hold on. Woo! So I got this one story about hiding. So we had this one guy that was on this NFL team, and this is what he would do. He was telling the pastor one thing, but going and doing another. So one night, he was out there doing his thing. Y'all, you know what I'm talking about. That brother was doing his thing on the club. He was out there doing his thing. And this is back when we used to put the cell phone on the hip. You remember that? And this is before butt dial was a butt dial. And this brother was out there, ooh, girl, I'm just, come on, let's dance, do my thing. And the pastor, all of a sudden, he catches with his elbow. See, that's why we say keep it tight. Don't be out there flailing and, you know, throwing your stuff. Keep it tight. And see, he caught it with his elbow, and it triggered the phone, and it called the pastor. <laughs> True story. We talking about don't hide. And so he out there doing his thing. Pastor Nathan, ooh, boy, just, just, just doing it. And it's, no, but it's recording. And so a couple nights later, pastor comes to him. Hey, man, what's up? What you been doing? Oh, pastor, I've been at the house praying, reading my Bible. You already know. You already know. And he said, Billy, boo, what's that? Yeah. Man, you ain't got no game, bro. That stuff you was talking to that girl was whack, bro. That was terrible. You trying to spit game? That's just the worst. Oh, yeah, hiding. See, God will lift the cover off of you and bring all your junk to the dark, to the light. It's better just to say, man, I ain't right. I'm through hiding, and I want to get right with the Lord. See, when you walk in the light as he's in the light, there's fellowship. 1 John. Five, there's fellowship. 
And it says that when I walk in the light as he's in the light, I have this deep koinonia where I know him and he knows me. See, God wants you to keep it so real. He wants you to stop hiding. He wants you to tell him, just like this lady was up here talking, just like her on the screen, I'm hurting. I need you to move. I got this going on. I grew up this way. I'm bitter. I'm angry. I hate my father. I hate my mother. I hate my teacher. I'm mad at my pastor. It's so many things that could be going on in your life. But see, when you walk in the light, as he's in the light, you have fellowship. And it says that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. All sin. My last point is this, is can you see him? See, they thought because of this eye ointment that, man, it was just, oh, man, I'm healed. I, I can see God. But you know what? They couldn't see him the way that they needed to see him. They didn't see him as Lord and Savior. They didn't see him as the Alpha and the Omega. They didn't see him as the God of the in-between, they didn't see him that way. The Bible says this in Psalms 119, 18. This is the Amplified Version. Open my eyes to spiritual truth so that I may behold wonderful things in your law. Can we say this morning, God, open my eyes to your truth. Now stop here. The truth hurts. I say this all the time. I played in a, a sport where they, they, they film your mistakes. Think about that. You can't come back and say, well, you know, I, I didn't send the, e I sent the email. I, I saw the, the text. I, I didn't, no, no, they film your mistakes. And then on Monday morning, what they'll do is you'll sit down with the rest of your peers and we will watch your mistakes. And if you keep making that mistake over and over and over again, what they're going to do is fire you. And what I mean by that is that my eyes got opened real quick to know that I can't hide, that everything is being monitored. And what we want to do is open our eyes to truth, spiritual truth. God, show me that you're real. Show me what I need to be doing. Show me how I need to be acting. Show me who you are because I need you. My last verse in Matthew 6, 22, your eyes are lamp that provides light to your body. When your eyes healthy, your whole body is filled with light. What is he saying? We got to guard our eyes and we got to let the Lord Jesus, let the light of God shine bright. Because the eye is the window to the soul. If I allow this stuff into my life that I shouldn't allow in, then it's going to corrupt the good thing that God has inside of me. See, 1 John 4, 4 says, this greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So what I'm saying today, if you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, he gives you the ability and the power to do all these things that we just talked about this morning. You have the ability and the power to live the life that God has called you to live. But here's where it all starts is going back and saying, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm going to repent today. You know why? Because the Bible says in Acts 319 that when I repent, times of refreshing will come. Do you need to be refreshed this morning? See, Karina said it, and I love what she said. She said, you know what? I'm tired. I'm, I'm going through some things. It's heavy, and you know, there's sin is heavy. There's some things this morning that you need to get free from. There's some things this morning you need to get away from. See, this church in Laodicea needed to understand that they were sinners and that they need a God that can take away their sins because he loves them. See, God doesn't want you and I laying in the bed hurting. He doesn't want you and I sleepless nights. He doesn't want us going around and saying I'm good when we're not good. He wants you to know internally, man, I'm good. Even when it ain't good, I'm still good because you're good. And so what I want to do this morning, this is not going to be a call to get our lives for someone to come down front, give their life to the Lord. I just want you to be open and honest with self. You know what you need to give up. You know what you need to be and do as a man or woman of God. Don't be like this water here. 
when it's warm. Don't be lukewarm. Because in your walk with the Lord, if you're lukewarm, it says, man, I'm going to spew you out. You make me sick. But man, if I say, Lord, I'm sorry, and I embrace him, and I do what I'm called to be and do, man, all of a sudden, I'm here with him, and he's here with me. And now I can be what God has called me to be, and I can be and do what God's called me to do.